We have to start off by saying, Tucker Carlson, you made the Dean's List. Oh, Dean's <laughs> First time in my life, Janice, I can promise you. No, that's you. not true. No, it is true. Come oh, on. Oh, it's very true. Well, tell me about that. You strike me as somebody that probably did well in school. Are you... Are you mocking me? No. Oh, no, no. I was a total loser. Come on. Well, academically, I had plenty of friends. I um, I enjoyed m the social elements of school, but no, I I had a, an almost uninterrupted string of Ds from about third grade until I finally, you know, got married at the end of college. Yeah. What? I, well, I have very bad dyslexia. Very bad. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. And it's fine. It's great. I mean, I've written a bunch of books and I have found ways around it but I'm <clears throat> definite I'm left-handed right eye dominant totally messed up with my spatial relations and uh, math and I just it's not it's not a, even a, a possibility for me but did you know that from a young age and who did you tell that did, did teachers help you with that when I was in first grade they knew something was wrong and I was at a school where they would like segregate out the kids with learning disabilities they didn't call it that. It was called stupidity. And they would sort of take you out of class. And, you know, like the, the proctor would show up and, like, take the dumb kids out. And I was in the dumb kids. The cohort that got pulled out of class, and I really resented it because I didn't think I was dumb. Um, I, I grew up with my dad, who was wise enough not to say, oh, you've got learning disabilities. He just kind of didn't mention it. I love to read. Uh, so reading really saved me. And I, I'm not you know, mentally defective. I just, certain things are impossible for me. I couldn't, like, park a car, you know, kind of thing. And so that definitely held me back in school. And also I was lazy, which was a huge, <laughs> huge problem. <laughs> but you turned your life around. I always, I... I needed I, to get out of school. That was the key. The second I left school and had financial obligations, the second I was, like, desperate, uh, I... I learned to work hard immediately, like first day, mm -hmm. and and I wound up in a business as a writer that I really liked and that came easily to me, and I didn't struggle at all to write or to edit or um, I've always liked words; they were my refuge. So uh, I had a completely happy work life. I've never had any problems, but school was a huge problem for me, huge problem. And so, what do you tell parents who have kids that do have learning disabilities? W what advice do you give them? Well, it's so it's so tough because I. I mean, I have four children. I would never want to judge other people's parenting. I have very strong views on it, which I generally don't share because I don't want to judge other people. But I know it worked for our family, which was, you know, any time someone from the school would come and say, your kid needs to be on this drug of some kind. You know, no. Yeah. I'm not putting my kid on meth. Back off, you know. And uh, I have a child who has pretty heavy-duty learning disabilities, and we've never done anything about it at all. I personally think it's our smartest child, which is not that unusual. Most perceptive, not good at everything, but extremely good at the things this child is good at doing. And um, and I've made a real effort to make certain that this child has never been singled out or told, you know, you get extra time on a test. No, you don't. You get a bad grade. That's totally fine with me. I've never been interested in grades. I don't think they measure that much. Mm -hmm. Our family's not a math science family. It's a humanities family. I'm the son of a writer, grandson of a writer. So... In our family, there's not really a question whether you're going to be like a structural engineer. You're probably not. Right. So for what our family is good at, it's fine, mm -hmm. you know, that you can't do certain things. And I also think, as I'm, I have no evidence for this, but just watching, I've concluded that people who, uh, who aren't good at certain things tend to compensate for that. And so if you're really not good at math, like I couldn't really add four-digit numbers, like no way could I do that. Uh, you have a, a greater strength than something else. And I've always been good at words. They make sense to me. I've always been fluent. And, and I think that's compensation for my deficiencies. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. I, I, I don't know that it's been proven, but I'm very happy, actually, that I had struggles in school because, uh, you know, it made me also very resentful. And I think it's important for young people, especially young men, to be a little bit mad about something. Hmm. You can't be complacent. You should feel like I've got something to prove. All the people who thought I was dumb, I never thought I was dumb. I always thought I was smart. I always had high self-esteem. But other people did think I was, you know, not impressive. And, and so I've kind of spent 30 years feeling like, yeah, well, watch this. And, mm -hmm. and I have a child 
who's very, very smart, who did not do well in school. And I said to this child, like, that's good. That's the nuclear reactor that will fuel your success. Mm -hmm. You know, always be, always have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. You don't want to think you've already won when the race hasn't even started yet. Yeah. And I do see that. Kids who graduate from prestigious schools and they did really well in school. It's like, I went to Deerfield. I went to Yale. Like, I've already won. No, you haven't. You haven't done anything. Yeah. You just follow the prescribed steps and collected two merit badges. That's not life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think the pandemic really opened our eyes to what is going on in schools with our children. I know that that was for me. Um, we put our kids in Catholic school because they weren't closing. And I think a lot of parents realized what was happening during the pandemic to our kids in schools. And we finally had to stand up and say, well, I, I think... I, we need to be back in school, so we're going to find a way to do that. And the Catholic schools in our area were still in session. I love that. Right. So, we, so ne we'll never look back. But the problem is we were fortunate because we had the money to do that. And we're supposed to care about oh. the most vulnerable children, and we didn't do that during the pandemic. Uh. And that's what gets me angry. Is, but the thing that p the pandemic the did oldest, for many of as us. As you pointed out, bravely and in public at the height of the pandemic, it was the oldest and the youngest— the people, you know, if you have that's an obligation right. to any two groups. Our kids and our elderly. That's exactly right. And as you pointed out and got right in the face of the governor of New York at a time when no one else was doing it, the state failed. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I have to tell our audience that when this was happening, I was texting you from the very beginning talking about what happened to my husband's parents, uh, how they were both in separate elder care facilities, and how I thought something was going on there. And I remember texting you and saying, not only do I think something is wrong here, I think they're putting sick patients in to nursing homes, but I think they're trying to cover it up. And I, at the time, I, my husband did not want me to go public with it. It was so deeply personal. Um, but you were the one that kind of said, when you're ready, I will give you a platform. Oh, and yeah. I will forever be so grateful for you because... That was the beginning of the advocacy, is reaching out to you and you saying to me, whenever you're ready, I think that's a story and it needs to be told. So I am so happy that I get to t tell you that in person well, today. Well, thank you. But it was not a tough call. It was a no-brainer. I mean, it's easy now to say, well, yeah, we should keep the schools open. We're going to really hurt our children if we don't. Yeah, we shouldn't introduce COVID into nursing homes. That's insane. You'll kill people. It's very easy to say that now. And the governor you confronted is now gone but at the time no one was saying that and everyone was afraid to say it and i think the most important thing in a moment like that of mass hysteria or group think where any deviation from you know the approved script is is punished it's so important for people to be brave and stand up and you were like the first person to be brave and stand up and i just i just admired that so so much and i and I, anything i could do to help in any small way was a great thing well I think it was a, many of us. That's one thing I've learned about advocacy. It's not one day, one week, one month. It's forever. Like forever yeah. I'm going to be following this story well, and making good. sure it try it no one ever does it again. And I really believe a lot of people actually people come up to me and say, "Oh, it's too bad there's not going to be any accountability." And I say, "No, there is going to be accountability." Oh, yeah. oh there will be. Oh yeah. Even if it's him in heaven and there's accountability. That's right. There will be. And I think too often people think that they're going to just give up. Nope. And I hate, I never quote Obama because I, I really, I'm a really non-fan, like for real, on a deep level. But the one Obama line I always think is true is the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And I wow. think that's right. I, I, I agree. That's one thing. That's the only thing Obama's ever said that I agree with. And I do agree with that. Yeah. The arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. We cannot see how thing, how the story ends because we're a point on a continuum and the future is unknown and unknowable. Yeah. But we do know looking backwards that people who are brave and honest and maintain their dignity and integrity under pressure are vindicated in the end. I believe that. Yeah. Are we going to, are we going to see accountability for COVID and how it got into the U S of course we are. And it, you know, the people culpable for it and the people who lied about it may be long gone. And we may be not here either to enjoy the, the, the final emergence of the truth, but it will come out. Everything comes out in the end. You can't have clarity except in retrospect, and often you're dead. But 
you know, I, speaking for myself, believe that we'll be able to see it wherever we are at that point, and um, I look forward to it. But no, I don't. I don't think we're getting justice this year. Right. That's <laughs> if that's the question. <laughs> How does faith play into your life? How does faith play? Yeah. It plays a pretty big part, actually. I mean, I grew up in a church that doesn't really exist anymore as a church. It's more a social justice movement. It's called the Episcopal Church. It would be Anglican in Canada. Yep. It's an offshoot of the Church of England in the United States. And it was, you know, the church of my ancestors going back a long way. And I grew up in it, went to the schools and was baptized in it and everything. I married the daughter of a, of a priest in that religion. And it kind of evaporated. And uh, it was a sad story. But that was sort of the beginning for me of a much deeper, much more interactive faith uh, based on prayer and silence. And, and I don't think I'm alone. In that. I mean, I'm, I'm hardly, I would never give anyone else instructions on how to be a Christian. Like, that's kind of the last, the last thing I would ever do. And you would definitely not want to follow my example or advice. I just know for myself, you look around and there's sort of no other explanation for what we're seeing there's and I know a lot of people are starting to feel this way and they may not like me fully understand what it is yeah but they know that there are larger forces at work on both sides here that's very obvious and so if I could level one criticism at American society which I love and was born in and will die in and hope to defend but the one criticism I would have is that it's too secular we don't allow for the possibility that what we're seeing is the result of Human decisions, of course, but also there may be other things going on. Like every society from the beginning of time that we know of has acknowledged the role of the unseen, of spiritual force, of the supernatural in, in daily life. I mean, everyone has always acknowledged that until about 100 years ago in the West. We we're like, oh, none of that's true. Not even 100 years ago, post-war, Second World War, so 80 years. And so we're, we're the anomaly. We're the exception to the rule. We're the only society since the beginning of time that didn't have conversations about God, you know, however you describe God, yeah, sure, but every society, I mean, you could go into the deepest, most remote parts of the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, Peru, and Colombia, you won't find a single person, do you believe in God? What? No, what does that even mean? Yeah, Mm -hmm. obviously. I mean, it's not even, it's not even questioned. Yeah. I think there's a reawakening to the reality that, of course, what we're seeing is not fully understandable. Of course. And I would also say, last thing I'll say, but is that I think the big mistake that we make is imagining that we can understand the world around us with great precision. We can't. Science can't explain everything, that's for sure. There are mysteries that science cannot penetrate. And once you realize that, you realize you're not in control of everything. Yeah. So the division, in my view is not between Christians and non-Christians or believers and non-believers. It's between people who believe in God and people who think they are God. Yeah. And people who think they are God are really scary to me. Yes. They're the ones who make the bad decisions. Mm -hmm. It's not evil people who make the bad decisions. It's not serial killers running our society. It's people who think they have the power to foresee the future and control it. Those people are terrifying. Yeah. Tell me about your wife, Susie. I adore her. She's great. I married my high school girlfriend. When did so you meet? Met? How old were you? First day of tenth grade. She was fifteen. And you remember it? I was twenty-seven. Just kidding. I would. I would. (laughs) She's actually a little older than I am. I don't. I don't know why I love that joke, but um, (laughs) it's so dark. But uh, yeah, we were we were uh, first day of tenth grade. We met at a school in New England, a boarding school. Her father was the headmaster of the school. That's scary. It was a little scary. I was bold. You were. She was too cute. I couldn't help it. <laughs> you know, one, one thing I'll say about um, love and lust and all that stuff, it's like, it does make you brave. <laughs> You'll do anything. But, okay, so what was it about her that you were like? I don't know. I've never figured that out. I, really? I've, oh, nope. I've never figured it out. It's chemical or something. I've never figured it out. I mean, there are a million things about my wife that I think are wonderful but ultimately you don't really know why this one person I, mean, I was actually dating some other girl um, and I saw this girl and I was like oh wow 
I was just totally blown away. I don't know if she was the prettiest girl at, at school. I have no idea, but to me, she was. And it's just, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know exactly, but I, I do think, I hear all these people say, oh, marriage is so hard. And I'm sure there are moments, you know, right when you have three or four little kids at home, it's hard. You don't have time. But I've actually never had a hard time on my marriage. Yeah. Never. Not one time. It's always been, the only problems in my marriage have been external problems. Like, we don't get to see each other very often, or we don't have enough money, or, you know, just the normal things that happen. Right. <clears throat> but, or the dog is sick. But I've never had a problem with her. I've always had an extremely warm, happy relationship with her and the more time I spend alone with her the happier I am and that's not anything that I did that's just I don't know what that is that's nature and just the right person meant to be right the right smell I believe in smell (laughs) you do yes really oh big time I believe in smell it's the most important sense so you can smell a person when you meet I can identify all four of my children by smell at like five feet really oh yeah what is that? I don't. And I smoked for thirty years. I don't have the best nostril, you know. Like I, yeah. Oh yeah, I can, I can, I can identify most people by smell. <clears throat> Do I smell okay? You smell great, <laughs> and I and I make judgments on the basis of smell, a lot, a now, lot. Something we were talking about that I find fascinating is my kids are still young. Um, you know, they're eleven and thirteen, and you told me that your kids are now out of the house. And I asked you how that is, because that's something that we think about. Like, how do we get back to the relationship that we had before kids, which was wonderful between Sean and I. And I'm, I'm, I think we're going to do great. But people are worried about that. Oh, like, how do we reconnect? So, people are so worried. And it, it is one of the... I, I got engaged at 22, 20, 21, married at 22, in a world where people did not do that. Yeah. My kids were always like, oh, that was normal then. No, no it wasn't. Right. At all. No, it wasn't. Because no. you and I are the same age. That's not yes. normal. And I lived in, you know, an affluent community on the East Coast, and that was, like, considered very... Anyway, so I've been married a long time. And so my kids are much older than my peers' kids. Yes. So a lot of people have come to me to say, you know, I, I love my wife, or at one point I did, but I've been very focused on my children, and now the last one is leaving, and I'm a little bit worried. Like, what are we going to talk about? I think it's a very normal concern. And... Here's what I've noticed. If you have, and, and if I'm being totally honest, it's very common for parents to be pretty mad at each other by the time the last child goes to school. And it's just true. <laughs> Women particularly mad at the husband because he was <laughs> off doing his thing and he thought he was providing for his family, but she felt abandoned. Yeah. You weren't here. You know, he comes home, treat me like the patriarch. What? I have no respect for you. You weren't even here. It's like that's a huge source of tension. Right. So the wife is often pretty mad at the husband, uh-huh. and the husband doesn't really understand why she's mad, but he doesn't want to deal with her. Okay. So he's like, I'm going golfing. Like, this is a very normal thing, okay? Yeah. The second kids leave, and I've seen it a lot, if you have even a spark of affection, if the fire isn't totally extinguished, if there's even just like a little glowing ember... <laughs> It's incredible what happened. It's un- I mean, I actually liked my wife by the time my kids left, but I think I was pretty rare in that. But I saw it with one of my closest friends. The second his kids left, he's like, I'm really worried, you know. Yeah. She's mad at me. <laughs> and she was, too. <laughs> I mean, he didn't, like, cheat on her, but he was just gone all the time. Right. The second the kids left, he, like, totally fell in love with her again. Aww. He really likes her a lot. And she appears to really like him. That's like, she amazing. chooses to be with him. And the truth is... Children are the thing that binds a marriage because they're the thing you have in common. You created these children together. Whether you get divorced or die, that will never change. Right. So they're the thing that is at the center of the marriage, but they're also the thing that keeps the marriage from being fully itself and certainly from being romantic. Yes. Because you can never let go of being a parent when the kids are in the house. Correct. Ever. Yes. And if you're wherever a young married person staying with your parents... You know what I mean? Yes. Like, you're newly married. You stay with her parents. You try and kiss her, and she's like, no! <laughs> my parents are in the house! <laughs> so, there. anyway, I, would just, I, I was just saying to a friend of mine recently, you won't believe how fun it is to be sitting in bed at, like, 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning with a cup of coffee with your wife and the dogs, and, like, no one's around. You don't have to go anywhere. Yeah. It's like, you haven't done that for 25 years. 
it's unbelievable. Yeah. How do you let your kids go, though? That's what I'm the most afraid of. They don't go of. anywhere. <laughs> I mean, but my kids worry, all moved to different cities. Do you still worry about them? Like, how? That's what I worry about. I like, never worried about my kids, you ever. You didn't. No, I'm very shallow. Well, what about... Stop. <laughs> I, just, I really didn't. I was like... I'm giving that to God, and yes. I did. Well, that's what I, I... The older I get, the more I do that. I just... Um, but you can't, because you're a mom. It's impossible. Aww. So Susie feels the same oh, way. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm not going and crazy. she's a real Christian. She's not like me. <laughs> she's like a serious, out loud, say prayers person every day. Um, oh. And it's wonderful. But, no, she's a mom. You can't... I mean, yeah. we're, this is genetics at this point. This is not what you choose to be or what you want. This is who you are in a way that you can't change. You're right. a mom. You gave birth to these kids. Like, yeah. no way can you turn that off. So, but I can more, and I, my children are all, four of them are thriving. Really, th- I mean, thriving in the ways that matter to me. They're all good people, and I work very close to all four of them, and I mean, I couldn't be happier with them, but they don't go anywhere. I talk to them every day. I had dinner with one of them last night. I mean, they're in different cities, but I mean, I... They're a huge part of my life. Yes. But they're not in the next room. Right. Which is great. Yeah. And I'm sure they feel that way about me, too. How do you deal with your success? I mean, I've known you a long time. Um, You are a huge success now. And with that comes the pros and cons, right? You are not afraid to speak your mind. You're not afraid to go on and take criticism. Um, How is that? I mean, have you always been sort of grounded or has it did it shock you a little bit? Um, you know, when you're seeing your name in newspapers and you look at, you know, your ratings are huge and people do love you and people do rely on you for to have somebody to listen to. I have very little sense of that. You know, I I've never read a story about myself and everyone you hear people claim that. But you can ask anyone who works with me. They're right there. Yep. I really never have. The New York Times did like a five part series on how I was like a fascist or something. I didn't read one word. I don't get my ratings. I don't know what they are. I've ne- you ask, that's my executive producer right there, Justin Wells. You can ask him. Who's I've, awesome. I've never gotten my ratings. I don't know what they are. I don't want to think about it. I'm not interested in being a public person. I'm not. I have a job that's obviously public-facing. It's in public, but I don't think of myself that way. I'm not, I don't spend any time around anybody who ever talks about my job ever. We don't have a TV in our house. You don't I, have a TV in your house? No. Wow. No, we never have. Well, we don't watch TV either. Either We do have a TV, but I don't... We no, no, we don't have watching. one, and my wife doesn't watch TV. She reads. I read. She's not interested in politics. She's gotten extremely right-wing over the years, I've noticed. <laughs> but mostly in response to liberals, she thinks that they're a threat to the family. Yeah. And then she's right. But she's not political. She's not... I've never had a political conversation with my wife, like... You know, there's some Senate race in Tennessee. What she has no idea. Do you tell her what you're going to talk about Never. on the show? No. Not one time. Really? Never. We don't talk about that. Do you? Why do you have four kids and four dogs and like all these nieces and nephews and lots of friends and we live in an extremely uh, rural area. Yep. And we, it's just not part of our world. And I don't have anyone in my world like that at all ever, ever. Yeah. Ever. And uh, I, I don't. You know, the thing about you don't want to be famous because being famous forces you to see yourself as others see you. And the second you start thinking like that, you start thinking about yourself and you become a narcissist. And narcissism is the root of all human suffering. Yeah. All narcissists are miserable. They're in hell. So if you want to be happy, do not think about yourself. Mm. Do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy what you I do? I love my job. You do. I don't, you know, I don't go anywhere. Like, I haven't been to a grocery store in years or anything like that. Um, So I don't enjoy that part. It's very hard to travel, so I don't travel, really, at all. I haven't really been anywhere since last year I was here. Do you miss that? I don't because I spent 25 years. I've been to every state more than twice. I've been to dozens and dozens and dozens of countries. I mean, I've been everywhere. Yep. And I that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I'm not into it anymore. You know, you go through stages in your life and, like, I love to hunt. I love to fish. I do that. I love nature. And so I just don't really have a sense of any of that at all. And occasionally, like one of my nephews would be like, oh, my professor was, I'm very close to my nephews. I have a lot of nephews. My Uncle Tucker, my professor was attacking you. And I'm like, why would you, I don't even know your professor. What? 
You know, like I just don't. Yeah. I, I don't want to have anything to do with that at all. I want, like, my experience of TV is sitting in the studio with the people who work in the studio, who are all friends of mine. Yes. Who've been there for years. My weird little studio, my barn, and like that's my world. I never think of anything beyond that ever. Yeah. Would you get into politics? No. <laughs> no way, man. No. I don't even understand politics. I thought Republicans were going to kill it last Tuesday. Right. I know nothing. I've been around politics for 30, well, my dad worked in the government. Right. So I moved to D.C. in 1985. I'm not good at math, as I told you, but that was like a long time ago. <laughs> Close to 40 years, I think. And I have a, you know, a child that works in politics. I don't understand politics at all. I don't, if I had to run a Senate campaign, like, we would lose. I don't get it. And my rule is don't do things you don't understand and you're not good at. But you talk about it. No, I, t I talk about the ideas, but I, I mean, I did get, so I had two friends who were running for Senate last cycle, this cycle. Yeah. J.D. Vance and Blake Masters, who I knew before and I really liked them as, as people. They're great people, both of them. And so I got very, like, sucked in emotionally I want these guys to get elected because I know them and they're great people they're good people they were doing it for the right reasons yeah they're yeah they don't they're not doing it for the money they're not doing it for the power they both have happy marriages and children they love and successful lives they, they're really upset about the direction of the country and they want to make it better so and I know that because I know them and so I was like all in on these two candidates I never do that I never like have people on vote for so and so that's not my world right at all. I'm interested in ideas, what's actually going on here. That's that's what I do. I don't do... And other people do different things, and they do shows about who you should vote for, or who's up in this race. I just don't. You know, everyone does something different. I don't. And uh, But I did more this cycle, and I was like, oh, yeah, Republicans are going to, you know, get a 30-point majority in the House, or they're going to take all these Senate seats. I was shocked. I mean, I was, sh I was so shocked. I just went... I was on a hunting trip yesterday. I took two days off, Monday and Tuesday, and went hunting in South Dakota for pheasant, which I love. And I'm in the middle of nowhere in South Dakota on the prairie in a snowstorm with my college roommate. And I'm like, I have no idea what just happened. I have no idea. Like, no idea. Yeah. What was that? I still don't know. So what do we do? Do we trust the polls? Do we just... We can't predict anything. No. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 let me just say... Something is deeply wrong. Yeah. And I'm not exactly sure what it is. I think there are probably a number of things that are deeply wrong. And I think most of them are obvious. If an election takes three days, if it took, I mean, I said I was dyslexic and I can't do math. Even I could count the votes faster than this. <laughs> I'm serious. This yeah. is crazy. We put a man on the moon. We right. do heart transplants. And it takes three days to count the votes in that a congressional district. Sense. And Democrats are overwhelmingly likely to win once it's delayed? No, it's that I don't I don't know what's happening. That's not good. Right. That's an attack on democracy. But I think there are also probably other things. I'm just I don't fully understand it yet. And I think it'll be a while before I do. Would you encourage your kids to do something like that, to get into government, to do it for the right reasons? I have one who is. Yeah. And he's naturally good at it. Um I I did try to so my father was a journalist, my great-grandfather was a journalist, and everyone's a writer in my family. So I said to my son when he was leaving college, I was like, you should go into journalism. You know, it's like, that's what our family does. Yeah. We're writers. We write books and articles and have TV shows. My dad had a TV show. And my son looks at me like, eh. <laughs> He's like, I want to go into politics. I was like, really? Politics is so dirty. He goes, yeah, but it's not as dirty as journalism. Oh, interesting. Oh, it really hurt my feelings, but oh. he was right. Mm. Because at least in politics, people are like straightforward about it. I'm a candidate. I'm running for office. I'm transparent. I may be a, a sad, emotionally needy person who's lying to you, but at least the core premise is transparent. I want your vote. Yeah. In journalism, people get on TV and they're like, we're just telling you the truth. But they're lying. Yeah. And it's like, it's crazy. And... He sees that as very corrupt, and he's right, and I wish I could defend. It's all I've ever done my whole life. I wish I could defend it more, but I can't. Mm -hmm. And you love to hunt, and you love the outdoors. I love the outdoors. I really care about it a lot. Yeah. A lot. And I have four dogs, and my dogs, I have two of them are still hunting because they're younger, and they just love to be in the woods, and so. 
I'm really, dra- at this age, I'm like dragged by my dogs. I'll like wake up, get a cup of coffee, and the spaniels are like, and, and literally, there's, I'm not bragging, I am bragging, but they're so smart. If I say to my dogs, got to go to work, they're like, ah. Oh. Oh. And that's what you're going to do, right? Do you think about retirement? That's my last question. No. Never. Well, I don't know if I would, I mean, I'm sure I'll get fired at some point, no. right? I, don't. I mean, of course, I've been fired many times before. I'm sure I'll be fired again. But, no, I'll always, I mean, I like to write, so I, will, I have two more books I want to write, and I have them in my head, mostly written, and I don't know if anyone will read them. I don't really care, but I, I have those books. A lot of people care what you say and talk about, well, and let you. me just be on the record and say that I adore you. You are a good human being, oh, you. and... I feel really lucky to know you, Tucker Carlson. Well, I'm blessed to know you, Janice. Thank you for having me on the Dean's List. The Dean's First, list. first and only time. Tucker Carlson made the Dean's List.